Chapter 9, Tuesday, November 2nd, 5.48pm. Weeds and clumps of grass poke through the cracks in the sidewalk. To my across the street, sighed, and then started up the wooden steps of her front porch. The middle step wobbled beneath her foot. Marshall's stupid shortcut had made her more than two hours late. Of course, she realised there had never been any shortcut. But that was the stupidest part about it. If he was afraid of Chad, he would have been safer walking along normal streets with lots of people and cars around. Her house was dark. Her mother occasionally worked late and Tamaya hoped with all her heart that this was one of those days. She wore her house chain, house key on a chain around her neck, but when she reached for it, all she could feel was the empty chain. Filled with panic, she almost broke the chain as she tagged on, tugged on it. Rotating it around her neck, she found the key. She breathed a huge sigh of relief. Somehow, it had twisted back behind her. Still, she knew her troubles were far from over. She unlocked the door. Hello, she called out as she opened it. I'm home. There was no answer. Oh, so far so good. No questions, no lies. Tamaya switched on the lights as she moved quickly through her house to her bedroom. The rooms were smallish, and each was painted in bright, bold colours, a red and blue kitchen, a yellow living room, a green hallway. Tamaya's room was turquoise with a yellow closet door and a yellow window frame. She dropped her backpack and collapsed onto the bed, but only for a moment. Her right hand still felt all tingly. She went into the bathroom and examined it under the light. Tiny red bumps were sprinkled over her palm and fingers. She washed with antibacterial soap and hot water as hot as she could stand. And using a washcloth, she cleaned the dirt and blood off her arms and legs. She was putting a band-aid on her knee when the phone rang. She wondered if her mother had been trying to call her for a long time. She rushed into her mother's bedroom and answered just before the fourth ring. Hello? Hi, sweetie. Sorry I'm running so late. That's okay, she said, guilt pumping through her veins. How does pizza sound to you? Good. You're right. I'm fine, Tamaya said, trying her best to sound normal. Mushrooms, peppers and onions, okay? No onions. I'll tell them just to put onions on my half. Tamaya didn't argue, even though she knew her half would still taste all oniony. I'll be home as soon as I can. Love you. Love you too, Tamaya said. She waited until she heard the click on the other end and then hung up. She finished with the band-aid and then returned to her bedroom where she changed out of her dirty clothes and into flannel pyjamas. There was no reason that she should make her mother suspicious, she thought. Not that the nights were colder. Now that the nights were colder, she and her mother both liked getting into their soft and cosy pyjamas, although usually after dinner. They'd drink hot apple cider and watch either TV together or more often than lately, work side by side. She gathered up her dirty clothes and took them to the laundry nook. There was nothing suspicious about her, her doing her own laundry either. She'd been doing it ever since she needed her favourite purple top for Monica's birthday party last year. Once when Marshall and his mother had been at her house, Tamaya's mother had said, I suppose if Tamaya waited around for me to wash her clothes, she'd have to go to school naked. Tamaya had been embarrassed and so mortified by what her mother had said in front of Marshall that she'd run to her room and hadn't come out until after Marshall and his mother had left. Even now, she blushed thinking about it. She dumped her dirty clothes into the washing machine, added soap, set the temperature and then started it up. Listening to the swish of the water, she imagined she felt something like the the way a murderer felt after he successfully destroyed all the evidence. Her right hand was still tingling like crazy. She went into her mother's bathroom and searched the drawers and cabinets, not sure of what she was searching for. She came across a blue jar of something called restorative hand cream. The label said it was for dry, cracked and irritated skin. Tamaya removed the lid, dipped her fingers into the white chalky ointment. She smeared it all over the bumpy spots. It felt cool and soothing. It seemed to work almost immediately. The bumps didn't look as red and the tingling wasn't as bad. 
From the other side of the wall, she could hear the rattle and the buzz of the garage door opening. Her mother was home. Two times four equals eight. Two times eight equals 16. Her mother set down the pizza, kissed Tamaya on the cheek and said, help yourself, I just need to answer this one email. The pizza box smelled of onions. Tamaya had to pick off a few strays before, before putting her slice on her plate. She had to do it all left-handed as so as not to get any of the restorative hand cream on her food. One email turned into six, but that was fine with Tamaya. The more her mother was wrapped up in work, the fewer questions Tamaya would have to answer. Her mother had made a salad as she'd read through her emails. She really did one thing at a time. So did Ms. Philbert like your report, she asked as she set the salad on the table. We ran out of time, Tamaya told her. She didn't get to mine. Oh, that's too bad, her mother said. You worked so hard on it. Her mother's hair and eyes were dark like Tamaya's, but she had lighter skin. She liked colourful clothes. Her green eyeshadow matched her blouse. Tamaya shrugged. I'll do it tomorrow. No one cares about Calvin Coolidge anyway. Tamaya would have preferred to give her report on a different president, but by the time Miss Philbert had gotten around to calling on her, all the good presidents had been taken. That was typical. Tamaya had sat quietly with her hand raised, but then someone else had shouted out, I want Lincoln! And then someone else had claimed Washington. Miss F uh, Philbert had assigned those presidents to the shelters, even though she had just told the class, Sit quietly and wait until I call on you. It was Miss Philbert who had suggested Calvin Coolidge to Tamaya when it had finally been her turn. He was a lot like you, Tamaya, she had said. They called him Silent Cal because he was known for being quiet. Mrs. Philbert had said being quiet as, the, as though it was some sort of abnormal behaviour. You're the one that who just told everyone to sit quietly. Tamaya had thought. After dinner, Tamaya and her mother were working side by side on the living room sofa. The TV was on, but they were hardly watching. Her mother had a computer on her lap and Tamaya's notebook was on the coffee table next to her history book. She wasn't supposed to just look things up on the internet. Tablets and smartphones were prohibited at Woodridge Academy. The headmistress, Mrs. Thaxton, wanted the students to do it the old-fashioned way. Even calculators were off-limits. Tamaya's mother looked up from her laptop and asked if Tamaya had washed her hands after dinner. You have pizza sauce on you. Tamaya looked at her hand. It wasn't pizza sauce. Despite her mother's hand cream, the red bumps had returned. They had gotten bigger and there seemed to be more of them. The tingling sensation had also returned, although she hadn't noticed it so much until now. She couldn't keep it from her mother any longer. It's not pizza, she said. I, I think I might have some kind of rash. She held out her hand. Tamaya and her mother each had the same habit of biting their lower lip when thinking. Her mother was biting it now as she ex examined Tamaya's rash. It feels all funny too, Tamaya told her. Do you know how you got it? I noticed it after school was all she could say. She had promised Marshall she, not to tell her mother or anyone else about the woods. I just put some of your stuff on it. What stuff? Restorative hand cream in a little blue jar. Good, her mother had said. I use it all the time and it absolutely works miracles. Tamaya was glad to have heard to hear that. I've got a meeting tomorrow morning, her mother told her, but if you want, I can cancel and take you to see Dr. Sanchez. No, it's not that bad, Tamaya said. I'll put more of the hand cream on it before I go to bed. We'll see how it looks in the morning, her mother said. Later, Tamaya thought that maybe she should have agreed to let her mother take her to see Dr. Sanchez. At least she wouldn't have to worry about Chad ambushing her on her way to school. You're next, Tamaya. Still, would a 7th grade boy really beat up a 5th grade girl at school with all the teachers around? She doubted it. He might just push her down or something, but then she could blame her torn sweater on him. Then Chad's parents would have to buy her a new one. In a way, it was sort of true. If it weren't for Chad, her sweater wouldn't have a hole in it. Once again, she examined the hole in her sweater. She tried looping some of the threads back through the hole and decided that maybe it wasn't all that noticeable. 
Tamai had another reason for not wanting to go to the doctor in the morning. It was something she'd never admit to her friends. She had never missed a day of school. At the end of each school year, she'd been presented with a certificate for perfect attendance. These certificates didn't mean quite as much to her now as they had when she'd been in second and third grade, but still she hated to spoil her perfect record. Before going to bed, she said her prayers, and on this night, she included Chad Hillengas. She didn't pray for anything bad to happen to him. She asked God to help Chad find the goodness that lived inside his heart. 2 times 16 equals 32. 2 times 32 equals 64. Chapter 10, Wednesday, November the 3rd at 2.26am. Tamaya slept. Marshall did not. As much as Chad had tormented him, he tormented himself even more. He lay in bed, desperate to sleep. He knew he'd have to be alert to deal with Chad, but sleep seldom came to those who are desperate for it. It is something that has to be eased into gently. He'd gotten into trouble for coming home so late from school. He was supposed to have looked after the twins, and when he hadn't shown, his dad had to leave, had, had to leave work early. The only way we can afford to keep you at Woodridge is for everyone to do their part, his father had reminded him. Good, I'll go to another school then, Marshall had answered. I hate that place. It didn't make any sense to Marshall. If his parents couldn't afford it and he hated it, then why not let him go to another school? But that argument only made his parents angrier. Then, on his way back to his room, He'd accidentally stomped on the twins' hippo village, which had caused, which had just caused more yelling. You're lucky I didn't step on you, he told Daniela. The whole thing was his parents' fault, Marshall decided. His birthday was September the 29th, and back when he was four years old, his parents had had, had to make a choice. Either he could start kindergarten as one of the youngest kids in the class, or he could wait a year and be one of the oldest. If they had waited, he'd be older, bigger and stronger, and Chad Hillengas wouldn't even be in the same grade. How many members are there in the US Senate? That was the question Mr Davidson had asked Chad. Um, 29? Chad had guessed. Andy was the only one who had laughed, not Marshall. How can there be only 29 senators? Andy had pointed out. There are 50 states. But then Mr. Davidson had said, Marshall, will you kindly tell Chad how many senators there are? Right then, Marshall had known he was doomed. He'd have considered giving a wrong answer, and maybe he should have, but who knows. If he'd said something like 28, or a million, Chad might have thought that Marshall was mocking him. Instead, what Marshall had done was stare down at his desk and say very quietly, um, 100, I guess. It was only a short time later that Chad had nearly thrown him down the stairs. We need to settle this once and for all, and you better be there, you thumb-sucking coward. Now, as he lay wide awake at 2.30 in the morning, Marshall tried to convince himself that since Chad had finally beaten him up, he wouldn't bother him anymore. They had settled it once and for all. Except he knew that the opposite was more likely to happen. Now that Chad had tasted blood, he'd come back for more. And he would come after Tamaya too. He imagined walking to school with her. She's yammering away about Monica or Calvin Coolidge or something when Chad grabs her hair, spins her around and punches her in the face. Leave her alone, Marshall shouts. Tamaya's on the ground crying. Chad's about to hit Tamaya again, but Marshall grabs his arm. I said, leave her alone, butt face. Chad shoves him. He shoves Chad back. A crowd gathers. Chad comes at him with all he's got, punching wildly, but Marshall holds his ground, ducking and hitting back. At first, Marshall hears everyone rooting for Chad, but as the fight continues, he starts to hear a few of his old friends, friends root for him. Get him, Marshall. You can do it, Marshall. And then... As Marshall tried to fall asleep, he imagined the fight ending in different ways. Sometimes he was the winner, leaving Chad beaten and bloody and begging for mercy. Other times Chad won, but only after a long, hard-fought battle. 
he envisioned himself lying on the pavement, barely able to move. Two pretty girls from his class, Andrea Thor and Laura Muskrantz, knelt by his side and tell him how brave he was to he, how brave he was as they dab the blood off his face with wet paper towels. And Laura kisses his cheek. But even as he imagined, imagined all this, he knew it would never happen. If Chad attacked Tamaya, the best he could hope for was that a teacher would break it up before Tamaya got hurt too badly. And then maybe Chad would be expelled. And then maybe after Chad was gone for a while, the other kids would like him again. That was his best hope. And he hated himself for it because he knew he was the pathetic hope of a coward. Chapter 11 Puff! Excerpts from the Senate Secret Hearings Senator Hastings Of course we all have great hope for non-polluting, inexpensive alternative to gasoline. But my big concern, Mr Fitzman, is what will happen when your man-made urn ergonoms mix with the natural environment. How will they affect plant and animal life? And ultimately, human life? We just don't know. Jonathan Fitzman. I've got that covered. Senator Hastings. The smaller something is, the harder it is to keep it contained. You can put a tiger or a grizzly bear inside a cage, but it's a lot harder to keep a tiny microorganism from escaping. Jonathan Fitzman. Not a problem. Senator Hastings. If you have your way, people will be filling their cars with violin at every gas station from Miami to Seattle. Tanker trucks will be hauling violin across the country. Drops will spill. Accidents will happen. Then what? Jonathan Fitzman. Look, all you've got... Uh, sorry, look, you've got it all upside down. And backwards. You're all worried about ergonoms getting out, but really it's just the opposite. I'm doing all I can to keep the outside from getting in. Senator Hastings. I'm not sure I see the difference. Jonathan Fitzman. Ergonoms can't survive in oxygen. Expose an ergy to oxygen and poof. Senator Hastings. Poof. Jonathan Fitzman. It disintegrates. Poof. You don't have to worry about ergies escaping into the air. At Sunray Farm, we have we had to build special vacuum sealed hoses and tanks just to keep the air out. Chapter 12, Wednesday, November the 3rd, 7.08 a.m. Tamaya woke to her favorite song. Cold air came through her window, purposely left open just a crack, making the warmth of the covers that much cozier. Her music came on at 7.08 every morning because eight was her favorite number. And Monica's favourite number was seven. Her best friend Monica also woke up each day at that exact time. Tamaya's thoughts drifted back to last year. There was a huge fireplace in the back of her fourth grade classroom. Her teacher had filled it with pillows and when the students finally finished their work, they were allowed to go to the fireplace and read. The fireplace was so big, there was room in there for at least four kids and she and Monica were usually the first two back there side by side reading their books and trying not to giggle. As Tamaya was thinking about this, a growing sense of dread slowly crept into her memories. The image of the, of the pillowed fireplace gave way to the woods, her torn sweater and Chad, his cold eyes staring at her as he said, you're next, Tamaya. Her hand tingled. She brought it out from under the covers to have a look. At first, she thought the rash had cleared, but as her eyes adjusted to the light, she realized the red bumps were still there, but covered in some kind of powdery crust. There was powder on her pillow, too. And when she pulled back the sheet, she could see it was all over the bed. It was a pinkish bronze color, the same color as her skin. She leapt out of bed and hurried to the bathroom. The powder rushed washed right off, but the rash had spread. Red bumps coated her entire hand and continued down her wrist. Some of the bumps had turned into blisters. 
Looking at herself in the mirror, she could see a crusty area on the right side of her face. She splashed it with water and then scrubbed the entire area very hard with a soapy washcloth and very hot water. There didn't appear to be any bumps on her face. It looked a little red, but that could have been from her scrubbing so hard. Her mother's jar of miracle hand cream was in Samaya's bathroom. The night before, she had dabbed a little bit on each bump and then gently rubbed it in. Now she went whole hog. She dug her fingers deep into the chalk chalky ointment and pulled out a big glob of the stuff. She smeared it on thickly over the entire area. And she returned to her bedroom, where she bundled up her sheets. Then she took them to the washing machine. <coughs> she set the temperature gauge to hot. You're washing your sheets now? Tamaya spun around. Her mother was already dressed, wearing a cranberry-coloured shirt and skirt and jacket. Her eyeshadow was the same colour as her clothes. Because of my rash, Tamaya told her, so it doesn't spread. Let me see. Tamaya held out her hand. Oh, it looks a little better, I think, her mother said. Tamaya knew that this was because it was covered up by the hand cream, but she didn't say anything. Her mother's breath smelled like toothpaste and coffee. Tell you what, her mother said, you tell Marshall I'll be picking you up right after school today. I can give him a ride home too if he wants, but then I'm taking you to see Dr. Sanchez. Tamaya nodded, glad that her rash would get treated. 2 times 64 equals 128. 2 times 128 equals 256. Year 6. Do you know why these calculations are being put here? Have a think about it and what do we know already? She put on her backpack, positioned the straps so they covered the hole in her sweater, and then walked quickly through the house and out the door before her mother could get a good look at her. She still didn't know how she'd explain the hole. She reached Marshall's house just as he was coming outside. He was wearing his old glasses. He'd switched from glasses to contacts over the summer. She liked his glasses better. She had thought his face looked blank without them. You're wearing your glasses, she said. He shrugged and then said, oh, I lost my contacts in the woods. Oh. In her mind, she could see Chad slugging him in the face and his contacts flying out of his eyes, although she realised it might not have happened that way at all. She could see no bruises on his face. He just looked tired and washed out like he hadn't slept for six days. He dragged his feet as he walked. On other days, Tamaya had, had to struggle just to keep up with him. But as they continued slowly up the sidewalk, she began to worry that they might be late. Her tingling sensation became more of a prickling. It was as if her hand was being stabbed by a thousand very tiny needles. Oh, my mum's picking me up after school, she told Marshall. She's taking me to a doctor because I've got a rash or something in the woods. She showed him her hand, but he barely glanced at it. You didn't tell her we went in there, did you? Marshall asked. No. Because if you did, we'd both be in big... I said I didn't tell her. Good. She can give you a ride home too, if you want. Yeah, whatever, Marshall said. But she knew he was glad for the ride, glad to be safe from Chad. They turned into Richmond Road. There was a lot of early morning traffic. And once again, Tamaya realised how much safer Marshall would have been if they had just walked home the usual way. She wouldn't have torn her sweater and he wouldn't have lost his contacts. And she probably wouldn't have got the rash either, she thought, although she wasn't really sure how she'd gotten it. As they walked alongside the woods, the feeling of dread she'd had when she'd first woken up returned. It seemed to grow heavier with each step. She couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was that she was dreading. She couldn't think. She didn't think that she was all that afraid of Chad as long as other people were around. It was something different, something worse. It was as if she knew something terrible was about to happen. But it was so bad that her brain wouldn't even allow her to think about it. They reached Woodridge Lane. This is where I was supposed to meet him, said Marshall. There was an area of weeds and dirt between the sidewalk and the fence. Tamaya figured that Chad must have climbed the fence and got into the woods when Marshall didn't show up. At least there would have been people around, Tamaya pointed out. It was worse in the woods. Don't remind me, he kicked at the ground. Tamaya felt sorry for him. She didn't like feeling that way. 
She liked it better when she used to look up to Marshall. Chad's just a big jerk, she said. I don't care about him, Marshall muttered. A big fat jerk, she repeated loud enough so that if Chad was hiding nearby, he would definitely hear her. They turned onto Woodridge Lane. The woods were on both sides of them as they headed towards the school. Tamaya quickened her pace. We'd better hurry so we're not late, she said, but Marshall continued to lag behind. She walked faster and faster, and then something inside of her made her want to run. It wasn't just the fear of being tardy. She felt scared. Although of what, she didn't know. She was out of breath when she reached the line of cars backed up from the school. Only then did she stop running. She heard someone call her name. Merrily, Monica's little sister, was hanging halfway out the window of her mother's Mercedes, waving to her. Tamaya waved back using her left hand. She tried to keep her right one hidden. She waited by the curb as Merrily and then Monica climbed out of the car. Where were you yesterday? Monica asked. I tr kept trying to call you. Tamaya wanted to tell Monica everything but didn't dare risk it. She knew that Monica would tell Hope and then it would be all over school. I don't know, she said. In and out. You need to get a cell phone, Monica told her. Well, they're not allowed at school, Tamaya reminded her. You can use it after school, said Monica. I was in and out too, said Merrily. And then I went in again and then I went back out. Monica told her sister to shut up. So you'll never believe who I saw yesterday, she said to Tamaya. Mr. Beauchamps, said Merrily. Shut up, I'm telling you, Mr. Beauchamps. He was jogging right in front of my house. He sees me and says, Bonjour, Mademoiselle Monique. I swear I almost lost it. Mr. Beauchamps had been their French teacher since the second grade. You wouldn't think a bald guy would have such hairy legs, said Monica. Tamaya forced herself to smile. Marshall was relieved to see Tamara safely, Tamaya safely enter the building with her friend Monica and with no sign of Chad. He wasn't sure what he would have done if Chad had attacked her. He liked to think he would have protected her, but he also knew that he might not have. He reached the front door. The seventh grade was located in the basement. It had been the servants' quarters, but everyone at school called it the dungeon. It felt like a dungeon to Marshall. He trudged on down the stairs, doomed to whatever torture and misery awaited. Okay, year six, we're stopping there for the day. But go back and think about when those calculations started. What do they mean? Two times two equals four. Two times four equals eight. Two times eight equals 16. What do you think they mean? Go back and have a look at where the conversations started in the United States Senate Committee on Energy and the Environment. Read through the secret hearings again, see if you can work out what those calculations might mean.